Alrighty, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Dragon's Den. This is In the Den's Maw, number two. Trying the experiment again. Uh, got a panel constructed today, and we are going to go over some non-news cycle sensitive topics and uh, see if there's any valuable information that comes out of that. So uh, with with minimal shouting over each other, want to go around the room and uh, introduce yourselves? Hey there, BTC FUD, local degenerate. Hi everyone, hey, Casso here. Hello, Blackheart, Bitcoin philosopher. It's the opening, someone can go for it. You can fit a name here. Bitcoin, some of you know who I am. What's up guys, Mardell here. This is your opening American huddle. Okay, we're going alphabetical next time. <laughs> All right. Well, American Hoddle is here. Um, he's gonna hide in a corner and cry. Uh, but we're, I think we're gonna break this up into two topics today and just kind of flush out first one, move on to the next one uh, when that makes sense. But let's kind of start this off just generally. Um, you know, blockstream conspiracies. Um, why are so many people in this space? so absolutely certain of the truthfulness of the crazy deranged nonsense that they just invent in their heads about Blockstream every day. Like what is going on there? Well, it starts with being special. <laughs> and then it becomes, it becomes, you know, all too obvious how, um, Blockstream represents a conspiracy to change uh, to refuse to change the variable that it's not really explained how anyone could change it or do prevent the power of unchanging scaling from taking over the world. Just takes a little bit of magical thinking and uh, a little bit of wanting it to be one way when not that way with blockchains and cryptocurrency, I think. Well, here's kind of like my my take on this is like the conflict of interest narrative is like always the foundation of it. It's it's like they are building these layers and platforms um, that they can make money off of because blocks are small and therefore they're the ones who keep blocks small. But, you know, look at the proportional outrage against Blockstream for that narrative versus Coinbase who openly just shoved like big block, big block. Like we want big blocks because that makes our business cheap to operate and just the double standard there. Yeah. I mean, every exchange is effectively doing transfers off chain and, you know, quote unquote, stealing fees from miners. Well, I wouldn't put it stealing fees from miners, but it's, it's the point is like there, there is like every company in this space that is trying to have some kind of involvement in the development process um you can argue a conflict of interest there so like why is it so fanatically screamed about blockstream but then you know a blind eye is turned to half the other companies in this space probably strong associations with um certain core devs and personalities well, is it more like uh, Bitcoiners uh, are screaming that or more like bots that saying that uh, because blockstream uh, works on Bitcoin? Well, I mean, it's kind of like the, the both of that. But like the, the issue is like even like developers, well, I don't know, Gavin was a big name. He was running around being an advisor and slapping his name on all kinds of companies, you know, five, six years ago. This is such a small, in terms of dollar value space, that you would almost expect anybody dedicating a lot of time or energy to this would be financially invested. I think you can extract from all the talk about governance in shitcoin space, the, the idea that governance is this thing that should be incorporated or considered. Um, you will see that being imputed onto Bitcoin, misunderstanding it's anarchic, you know, all exit, no voice governance and associating any um, cluster of core devs and Bitcoin maximalist type thinkers 
like Blockstream uh, with the governing entity. I think Shinobi has it right about the conflict of interest. I think the conflict of interest that people would argue about and are concerned about is you had so many core devs who were working for Blockstream. I think they think the conflict of interest is the inherent potential control that those core devs might have on the influence of the underlying base protocol. I think that's the essential conflict of interest, which is the biggest worry. And I think that concern goes to not understanding how the core devs work, how uh, how how developing the protocol works. And I, to me, I think that's probably 90% of it. Yeah, Matt or uh, American Hollow, you guys want to kind of jump in the ring? I haven't heard anything from you guys yet. Well, first of all, it's a little bit overwhelming format. I so I think two things here. First of all, I think every good conspiracy uh, starts with a little bit of truth. Definitely, if you go back a couple of years and you looked at the core dev funding landscape. Uh, Blockstream did have more, they were more outsized there than they are today. So that combined with something like Liquid, and I think these, I think Bitcoiners should be critical of, of all these companies in the space and they should be always, you know, keeping them in check. And just because Blockstream was producing more than others, uh, we saw this, this pushback. And then the second thing I wanted to mention that no one really is talking about right now. Um, do you see they're about to launch cloud mining? Um, actually, I, I haven't had a chance to. Um, I saw like the big um, like uh, video series they dumped looking at like the the hedging um, options for miners and all of it, but I, I just haven't had the the time to really dive through it yet. They're like they haven't formally announced it yet, but they're setting up. Um, like Samson had a had a presentation, and I think they're calling it DABA, and they're saying it's better than dollar cost averaging. It's difficulty adjusted Bitcoin accumulation. I think it stands for. Um, and I just I I can tell they're about to set up the cloud mining thing. I'm ready to flip shits about it when it happens. Well, I mean, if if that I saw that, and um, I I didn't take that as cloud mining, but like I I literally just saw the tweet and then assumed from there. Um, but I just kind of saw that as looking at like the data analysis of um somebody who can hedge like the the operational cost properly that you actually can buy cheaper than spot because anytime you know the electricity cost um with the difficulty is cheaper than spot like that does make sense to to mine and so like i i definitely get your hesitance if that is kind of where it goes with the history of cloud mining in this space but you know my problem isn't with the concept it's that all the implementations so far have been scammy as shit. like i think with the proper like financial structure and products to hedge that you could do that in a not scammy way um there would still be risk but yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of just gonna have to see how they they pull that one. You know what I mean? My problem will be if they try and sell this to retail with Daba. I, I I think most people that have been in the space a little bit have have seen that that newcomers often flock to the cloud mining. Yes, there's absolutely an edge you can find if you're a professor and if you're you know, controlling your own hardware and you have good electricity prices and you, you time things right. But in terms of cloud mining, I think like the overwhelming experience that people have had is a negative experience. So it should be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's you know, all about how you structure it. Because, you know, like semantically, what's the real difference between a cloud mining service and a hosting service you ship hardware to? It's like how much of that you verify and where that hardware came from. You know what I mean? And I don't know. I, I, I just I can't see Blockstream doing something like that without a way to smooth the risks 
like for customers a lot better. You know what I mean? But the whole point of cloud mining is to offload the risk onto retail. Well, so, I wouldn't say and, and I, I would retail. say the two main reasons a, an individual user would want to mine, um, I think, is 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 most I, I think the main reason is privacy related you lose that aspect um and then trust minimization is the the second reason you don't have to trust a third party to accumulate bitcoin and you lose that aspect as well so i don't see what the advantage is to a to a retail user to even cloud mine to begin with well it's you know what's the the use for buying bitcoin now um versus when it goes down to 3k i mean it's it's risk management but you know the the issue is is really kind of you know let, let, let's kind of flip this back a little bit you know like this is a legitimate concern i think like i i don't really see it as that as big of a concern as you might but like you know this is the kind of of thing here like where does this um, stop being looked at as a legitimate concern and where does this start crossing the territory of like we're just being Alex Jones right now you know what I mean yeah I'm just saying I think there's a middle ground here where we should all be critical yeah I can definitely respect that but like you know let, let's, cut, let's flip this around like if Bitmain hadn't done all the crazy shit that they did during the new york agreement the uasf b cash um would would any of us have a problem with bitmain being such a massive um influential company in this space i was waiting to see if someone else was going to jump in here i mean bitmain can go fuck themselves i don't know i don't know uh and i can't do that theoretical in my mind all right, all right, but okay. Let's try it this way then. Um, I think if you have like a major company uh, that 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 has a lot of control, start trying to flex their power, push back, and we saw that with Bitmain. Yeah, but I, like, I do agree that the that the block stream there goes to extremes. Everything goes to extremes, and on Twitter. It always goes one extreme or the other. You know, it's it's either um, lizard people or they're absolute saints and we should worship them, right? But it's really there, there's nuance to it. There's re it's really somewhere in the middle. Are we gonna do this thing? We've been doing this thing, <laughs> but um, yeah, because it's like you know, Matt, you you have a concern here with this, um, and I think it's not. Uh, an invalid concern but like I'm looking at this situation with a little less information than you and my first thought no. of that was not retail it was you know big institutional money like how does that pool of money get into Bitcoin when order books start drying up yeah, look if it's institutional money then so be it but I'm just calling it now right here that I have a feeling they're about to, you know, dump this on retail. Well, we'll find out. But, you know, let's, let's kind of swing back to, you know, what Tina was touching on regarding the conflict of interest um, between Blockstream itself and Bitcoin as far as developers that they employ that actually contribute to the protocol. And like that as a source of all these kind of conspiracies and why that's just not looking at how this works properly. Like, you know what I mean? That's, it's kind of the issue of, well, yes, they contribute and work at that company, but what does, what power does contributing to Bitcoin give them? I thought I everyone, believe. I thought everyone just went silent. <laughs> All right. They Welcome believe to the that, bubble. Uh, <laughs> that protocol rules that, you know, and uh, hard forks to change them are the product of a different kind of social consensus that it is. They think it's the product of governance or something resembling democracy or influence. 
And, you know, that's why they're so concerned over, say, Reddit censorship and Thamos, um, because they think that if you can just get the, the message out and get the critical mass together, then a two megabyte hard fork should be able to happen, no problem. Yeah, that's why it becomes suddenly becomes a problem when you're a socially influential collection of respected voices in the space that really can feed this conspiracy ideas. Yeah, but you know, you look at those people and how they reacted to say the UASF and the NYA. Like that was the pivotal moment where everybody's fighting over like what is actually going to to happen now. What direction are we going to go in? And most of those people um just stepped back. Like they either refused to take an open stance on it or the stance that they took, um they took as an individual and refused to put that that reputation behind it. Yeah, so the conspiracy theorists really don't respect the heterogeneity of views in the, you know, in core and uh, among Bitcoin maximalists. Yeah, so it's like, can can I chime in a second? Yeah. So I I may have a different take than some people on this. Um, Bear in mind, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm not really technical. I come to it with certain biases and opinions so number one i think you can have good actors not everybody has to be a bad actor some actors can actually be good actors i come to it with the idea that if the goal is to ultimately make bitcoin the only money that pretty much everyone in the world uses you have to recognize from that proposition that there is no chain that can scale at the base protocol. So you come to it with the idea, recognizing that no chain can scale from the base protocol, that you have to create something that can sort of create this, what I'll call a funneling effect, where you're using that base chain to prove out other layers to to lock everything into that base protocol. And and I'm sure this is not the correct language to use. So I I don't know what the right language to use is. So if I do something on uh, a second or third scaling layer that ultimately it will prove down cryptographically to that base protocol, maybe literally thousands and millions of transactions away from that. But ultimately it's that base protocol which is guaranteeing that thing to happen. On a global basis, ultimately, there'll be quadrillions of transactions that are taking place. There's no way that can happen at the base layer, no matter how big your blocks ever get. So the whole notion that you could even make bigger blocks and try to ultimately satisfy hundreds of millions of people using this thing is ridiculous, much less billions of people. So I think there are people who are working on this who thought about these bigger issues and understand these types of issues associated with it. And I think you've got, in the altcoin space, people who are trying to make unsophisticated arguments that they can come up with a chain that can literally handle quadrillions of transactions. And and I think that's just blatant lying on the part of the people trying to make those claims. And if you look at how many, <clears throat> how many financial transaction processing companies we have in the world, you start factoring in banks plus transaction processors, you're talking about a staggering amount of transactions. So I think you've got people who are looking at this from some fanciful point of view. Personally, I expect the Bitcoin ecosystem will grow. I want to see companies grow in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and I want to see those companies make money. I think that's a good thing for Bitcoin. I don't see that as a bad thing. This is not some charity enterprise. This is an enterprise that will use its money and will ultimately replace the existing financial system. We ought to have companies that are making a lot of money in this, doing the things that are necessary to make this whole thing work. I don't have a problem with any of that. That's sort of my general take. Yeah, imagine thinking liquid is a, a bad thing. Yeah, I think technical incompetence is um, almost certainly a necessary condition for most of your block stream conspiracy theory positions, not respecting uh, the sensitivities of this global network needing to stay synced, initial blockchain download time, um, the the network fragilizes 
as you need to consistently pass more data around and send it between all these nodes. And so one vein of um, kind of like anti block stream narrative has been the idea that as you build up layer two and people are transacting in Bitcoin, um, that steal that takes demand from um, on chain transactions and compromises minor revenue in the long run, building this sort of Tower of Babel. That's one of the more interesting um, kind of danger sense reactions to layer two and block stream type activities in Bitcoin. You know, you, you kind of touched on something, I think, that is a, another layer of cognitive dissonance in here, Tina. Um, the fact that the people who LARP as ANCAPs, like companies and private markets should solve everything, are the people screaming the loudest about the big evil company that shouldn't have anything to do with this. It's the difference between people who reject illegitimate authority and people who have kind of an attitude about authority in general when they find themselves on the wrong side of a, a natural community authority. Yeah, there's a disorder for that. It's called oppositional defiant disorder. And every B catcher you talk to suffers from it. Why also am I thinking of Kevin Pham all of a sudden? <laughs> Kevin Pham has oppositional defiant disorder as well. Yeah. And he's a little gay. Y'all know that. He gets kicked off YouTube, American Auto. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's like you know th this is kind of like the the weird thing about like this whole topic is just this the the onion layering of cognitive dissonance, and you know this is like one aspect of it is something like this. It should have people competing to like influence and add things to it. And ultimately, the users or the the consumer, um, you know, are, are the ones who ultimately make that happen or not. And the people screaming about like how evil Blockstream is, are the ones screaming the loudest. Um, you know that that's how the world should work. And you know, you you kind of take it back even to like the the entire concept of layering um, that Tina just tied everything um, together with. Like even that is like itself a market force in the similar way that you have like the, the, you know, the, the acquirer of raw materials sells that and then somebody adds some value to that and then sells that. And then eventually it's the product with all the layers of added value and somebody benefiting off of that getting to the consumer. And it's like that similar market abstraction is the same way that layering works, kind of collapsing back down to the chain as the root resource. And yet those people arguing that's how the world should work are the ones screaming about how we can't do that. And it's like, it's just cognitive dissonance all the way down. Milton Friedman wrote a great uh, article about the life cycle of uh, the pencil based all the hands that are in, uh, you know, the manufacturing, the distribution, the use of the of just a simple pencil. I mm -hmm. I just I'm the point I'm trying to make is I just feel like we need to be careful not to fall back into like a straw man line of reasoning. Um because like for instance, like how do we feel about two things? The the fact that a lot of of the top guys at Blockstream were super against tokens and now their business model relies or you know one aspect of their business model is like exchange tokens and other bullshit tokens uh, on top of liquid and then the second thing is is what 6102 bitcoin has been driving home is that this this kind of inflation with liquid btc versus regular bitcoin um and also just in general like how liquid is going to tie together all these different exchanges do do we think that if it wasn't blockstream that the community would have more there'd be more criticism directed to them like i i feel like there's i feel like the problem isn't that there's too much criticism towards blockstream i feel like there's too much waving away of it well 
let me i'm gonna i'm gonna just speak for myself here because like i feel like me touching on this topic like personally i constantly have straw men thrown at me as far as my attitude about all of this i have never had a problem with tokens ever my problem is with people raising money for shit that they haven't even started building yet or shit that is literally impossible to do like i don't care if somebody makes a token it's when you scam with that or or mislead and misrepresent things to people and then you know as far as liquid um and bitcoin i i honestly matt i think that 6102 is being kind of stupid about that um and this is just a, a waste of time and just causing nonsense tribal bickering for no reason. Um, like, do you do you feel the need to distinguish the difference between um, a cash dollar bill and the dollar in your bank account? No, it's a dollar. You know exactly the differences between that bill and that that balance in your bank account. This bill you have in your hand and can do whatever you want with. The bank can take the dollar in the bank account. Like you, you don't argue which one of those is a dollar or not you understand the difference in the way you're interacting with a dollar yeah and this is something that has been coming up more and more the subtle difference of different forms of money whether it's bank account money that may happen to earn interest or not whether it's a dollar in your pocket whether it's this magical form of money that mark cuban suggests we should have that goes poof if you don't give it to the next guy in a given amount of time you know, this goes into, are you a platform maximalist or are you a monetary maximalist? Because personally, I, you know, it, like, think about it like this. If the shitcoin, you know, explosion had happened on Bitcoin, we all would have defended it. I would have defended it as, you know, market behavior. Although we probably wouldn't be defending the shitcoins themselves. No, but you would be defending people's right to shitcoin. Yeah, Blockstream is a technology services provider, right? That just happens to be in the Bitcoin slash cryptographic blockchain space. So what, what's wrong with them offering services there? They're basically doing these things that were theoretic, theoretical not so long ago and now selling it as a service and proving there's interest. Like liquid stable coins are a pretty good example of, of that. Um, inevitably, you're going to get your hands dirty if you become institutional in bitcoin space um with all the interface with the out world and i you know i have no reason to use a stable coin aka euro dollar but it seems like there is a significant market demand for it yeah you know real real quick i, I want to kind of come back to matt real quick um but it's like you, you know i i know there are those people out there matt who like scream tokens period or bullshit and then but now the they're flipping does. the argument. Yeah. But it's like, you know what I mean? It's you, I think that is a kind of thing where you have to look at like the individual and what their individual position has been. And like, yeah, there, there are people who've kind of flipped around like that. But like from my perspective, like there's always been people at Blockstream who just didn't care or thought that side of the business was stupid. Like they're just there because I can work on Bitcoin here. Yeah, my only point with that was that I just thought there was hypocrisy there. Uh, I mean, I've defended people's right to get wrecked on shit coins. I've always, I've always defended that right. My issue has always been the proprietors of the shit coins and them lying about trade offs. Mm -hmm. um, but back to, so my real concern with Liquid is I think that it decreases Bitcoin custodial risk at individual exchanges but it increases like a black swan custodial risk across many big exchanges that happen to be also the easiest companies to regulate in the space. And they're tying all their funds up together. And I feel like not enough people talk about that. And I feel like that's mostly what 6102 is getting at. Like, I think if you ask 6102, he would say there needs to be more of a distinction between Bitcoin held on a custodian versus Bitcoin not held on a custodian as well. Um, he just the 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 recent his recent battle has been specifically liquid i i think you know there has been a push to start calling those bitcoin ious and being pretty emphatic about it and i you know i've been 
using that language a lot. I think that's the correct language to use. Well, it's kind of like they're fiat coins, not stable coins. Shut the fuck up. There's nothing stable about fiat currency, as we all know. So why are we giving them the branding on that? But uh, yeah, uh, I think people need to be aware of the form that they're getting their money in. And there are lots of people that are advocates of have your own private keys. And that means you have possession of the bearer bond. It is yours. Hopefully nobody else has seen it. Hopefully you can be crafty enough to keep that happening but this is no different the liquid btc um from say blockfi btc you're you're trusting some other entity with your btc if you take that to an extreme form tether btc do you guys think that there's going to have to be a mount gox level failure uh at some point in the future after wider adoption so that people collectively learn this so i guess what i'm kind of saying is like matt what if it does transpire but net because then it really drives on the lesson of like hold your own point though well i mean i think that there's definitely going to be hacks the bigger we get i don't think there'll be another mount gox though um i think the bigger we get the more that liquidity is going to kind of spread around and you know as far as the security trade-off like you're 100 percent on point there matt but the way I'm looking at that is we're not even getting started as far as like how much we can improve that counterparty minimization with these types of side chains. Like there, there is a lot more that we can do to just kind of iron things down a little tighter and build a little more um, like safety hatch features and that, that type of shit into how the peg works. I mean, so I personally would like to see you know, many more federations come up. I think, um, I I think it increases it increases the robustness of all of them if there's a bunch of them rather than just one big one. Uh, like yep. basically, if I'm if I'm trying to like visualize my concern is imagine Liquid is a success. is a is a very big success. The traders are using it. We know. Uh, there's the large user base that just trades Bitcoin. That's what they do. And that's going to you know, keep going up as adoption goes up. Um, let's say the majority of these exchanges start moving to liquid Bitcoin. Uh, they start moving to liquid Bitcoin. Traders enjoy liquid Bitcoin more because they can transfer it quickly and they got confidential transactions on it. Um, if there is some kind of government regulatory event there, you could see a situation where even users who aren't holding liquid Bitcoin, that they're, they're holding some other asset on these individual exchanges, they, they all get, like in Bitfinex, where everyone got a haircut, even if your token wasn't the one that was stolen. Well, see, here's the beauty of liquid. Um, and this is, I think, going to be kind of the first big jump in the long term that starts addressing this kind of risk. Um, they've implemented dynamic federations now. Um, so you can just add or remove members of the federation in terms of sidechain consensus dynamically. And then as far as the federation on the main chain, like you and me right now, Matt, could just start pegging Bitcoin into Liquid. We could go make a multi-sig Liquid token, give people a multi-sig on the main chain we set up, and we're now pegging Bitcoin into Liquid. So there, there can be as many federations pegging in or out as you want. That's no, just... you can peg in, but not out. No, but that's my point, Matt. Is like LBTC, the native token, is not the only token that represents Bitcoin on Liquid. You can make as many Bitcoin tokens on Liquid as you want that you peg in through as many different federations as you want, and they can all interoperate. I mean, think about it. if the Liquid federated sidechain model is, you know basically if, if it's doing really well then and and at the same time shit coins die <laughs> you can see a lot of people coming up and creating their own federated side chains oh yeah i think there's going to be shit tons of them but like the, the the main point i'm trying to make with liquid specifically is you can have multiple federations maintaining a way to peg in and out on the same side chain I just think what 6102 is saying, not your keys, not your coins. And that shouldn't really be controversial. Yeah, but you know, 
that shouldn't go to the absurd extreme of like anything that does not involve you holding the keys on the main chain is not in any way Bitcoin. You know what I mean? I come back to like the, the dollar bill versus the dollar in your bank account. Like this shouldn't be a ridiculous tribal argument over what is or isn't the dollar. They're both dollars. They both have different like trade-offs. Man, we were supposed to be so making fun of crazy people, and now so, we're seriously talking about tokens. This is how I've thought about game. tokens. This is, this is I imagine the a company system. would have. Ah, oh, man. And Tina got wrecked. All right. Well, um, poop. There he is. All right. Let me drag him back in. I imagine All right. Hold on, Tina. You got, you got disconnected there. Uh, I so know. Where where did I leave off? Literally got disconnected right after you started. Okay, fine. So I I imagine <clears throat> this is regarding tokens. So I imagine um, ha sort of an accompany model. A token would be might be necessary for uh, the revenue side of their business. It might be necessary to run whatever they're doing, but that token wouldn't really vary much in price and would have nothing to do with ownership of that business that's trying to do whatever they're trying to do. And then there might be some form of equity you might be able to own as a token or own directly with that company. And so I don't, if I view tokens that way, I don't have a problem with tokens at all. I buy a token with Bitcoin, just like I'm going to go to an amusement park or ride the subway. I buy the token, I use the service and the whatever business that is that's using those tokens gets the revenue from that. But it's not a trading thing. The token is just literally a utility token that may be necessary for running their business. Uh, that's how I see tokens. Now, maybe that's wrong. Again, I'm not technical. So I don't know if that makes sense or it doesn't make sense. But that's my vision of what tokens would be. So buying a game token where you want to spend money on whatever silly thing that you want to spend money on, I don't see why that should be a problem. I, I, I don't think it would be smart. I think it's kind of silly, but people do lots of silly things. My vision for is we're going to do a lot of legacy things on our way to moving to what will be a Bitcoin world. I think a lot of things that exist now won't exist in a Bitcoin only world. And a lot of people don't agree with my opinions on this. I think things will look very, very different ultimately, but people are absolutely going to take what they know and try to impose that on Bitcoin, I think ultimately Bitcoin will give many of those people an awful lot of pain in one way or another, and they won't continue to do that. So Bitcoin will change them. They won't change Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, tokens are an interesting thing as far as, you know, what they are in this space, because Everybody just keeps scrambling for this notion of magic tokenomics um, that's going to recreate Bitcoin like incentives. And like my whole attitude um, is that that's insane. And it's this simple. We've had tokens for forever. Um, they're called gift cards. And right. they are tied to either a actual currency or an actual product um, through a redeemer um, always guaranteeing redemption at that pegged value, whether it's a real currency or the product. And you know, you can't, I, oh, sorry, my bad. But it's like you can't do that in a decentralized way. Like, how do I have a McDonald's gift card that I can go spend at McDonald's without McDonald's guaranteeing they'll accept it? What I was going to say is tokenomics are not insane, they're duplicitous. You know, you remember back to 2017, you had all these VCs talking about, you know, utility uh, value and how, you know, the more utility your coin had, that would accrue value. And at the same time, out of the other side of their mouth, they're talking about short time to liquidity. So they knew that they were just pumping a narrative to dump on unsuspecting retail investors. And that's exactly what they did. So I think that's where a lot of the hate comes from for tokens. But there's nothing inherently wrong with a token, like Tina said, I, I go to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids, I buy some tokens, we put them in the machine. That's 
something that I've agreed to, and I'm fine with it as long as I'm inside of a Chuck E. Cheese. We copied Bitcoin, and now we need to come up with a reason why after the fact. And exactly. I think Blockstream has been kind of trolling these guys um, with their support for tokens on, on Liquid, et cetera. In part because, yeah, it's not like Shinobi said, it's not a per se opposition to people experimenting or doing tokens and stuff. It's uh, the problem is if that's ultimately hosted on a network that has no viability in the world. Exactly. Man, this is hilarious. We 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 were supposed to be talking about how stupid B cashers are and all the crazy shit they think, and now we're seriously debating whether Blockstream is fucking good or not for Bitcoin. Guys, do you you just fucked me out of my bonus shill check for this, guys. I hope you realize that. I hope you're fucking happy. Yeah, I'll probably get a reprimand too. They got me on the payroll. <laughs> This conversation would never happen if we were uh, BSV tards because we'd just all be like, 10 reasons why Craig is great and go. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I mean, I've listened to a lot of the BSV guys. They really think that an economy unto itself can, you know, on, on chain, as they say, can uh, infuse value into the token as if it wasn't, you know, leaky and convertible into anything else in the world. They don't realize there is no such thing as the on-chain economy. There is just the economy. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like they're, you know, this brings us sort of, I guess, to uh, Bitcoin, you know, government in the Bitcoinized world, which is, I think a lot of people are missing the fact that we're here to co-opt to the state. We're here to infect other systems. You know, building our own systems right we're also going to take down other systems as we go. That's sort of the whole thing that's happening here. So I haven't heard this from the BSV folks, but uh, the steel man position that I think is sort of emerging from this argument is that some of Blockstream's sponsored and promoted solutions could create new zones for political attacks on Bitcoin, like, you know, the set of exchanges running liquid. You, know, you regulate those. You have a big swath of Bitcoin that you can you know, hopefully exert some control over if you're the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. I was literally just going to ask you guys if uh, you wanted to kind of shift along to the the, the next topic, Coddle. Uh, good intuition there. But uh, yeah, you know, like Bitcoin, how, how does government work with that? Because that really changes absolutely everything about how they finance themselves. I don't know if anybody read the, this article I saw floating around on Twitter this week, but it was about basically how, um, you know, Christianity uh, infected the Roman Empire through Roman Emperor Constantine. And that, you know, it's sort of the Roman Empire used Christianity in a way uh, to stay relevant and maintain their power and the status quo. But then, you know, over a long enough timeline, Christianity wins out. Uh, you know, it's still around even after the Roman Empire. Balls, and I think we might see something like that with Bitcoin and governments, where you know Bitcoin infects uh, large states, and they use it, uh, they co-opt it for their own means for a short time period, and then long term the state falls by the wayside. Like we're not going to live in a world without governments; there will still be governments, but they're going to be severely diminished. That's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, I think that like. What it does is at the root, ultimately, um, like there is no way to finance things through anything but taxation at that point. And by the virtue of how Bitcoin works, um, there's really no viable point at scale to tax people except the point of consumption. I agree. Because it's like you can't run around the whole world um, and, and grab everybody who just bought something in a store and go give me my tax. So you go to the store owner and you go, hey, give me my tax. And then he passes that on to the consumer. And it's 
like it, it hits this devolution um, towards a point, and I'm sure half the people in this space are gonna gonna scream rip Shinobi's head off now. Um, where at least in my mind, um, you can't argue that taxation in that form is theft anymore, because um, if you just think about this, it's a group of people in an area that decide we want to pay for something communally. The business owners collect taxes that they bake into the prices for things. You know, people choose to shop at that business and then they put it into funding whatever they're trying to communally fund. Those business owners opted into it. That consumer opted into it when they walk in and pay. So as long as that starts off voluntarily, how can you argue that that form of taxation is theft? I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that argument, actually. The problem I mean, if it's is, a uniform and not a democratic quorum, sure. Yeah, the problem is it's just, you know, it's, it's never going to stop there because, like, for, property tax will never go away because they know where the property is. They'll just come to you and tax you. Mm-hmm. Any, any, any tax they can enforce, they will enforce. A uh, flat tax on sales has the advantage of being elegant and uh, I, I think a pretty well. Um, uh, a, a pretty supported position uh, among like, you know, tax reform um, people, think tank folks. But I mean, this yeah. assumes that the government has already completely lost um, its senior ability. And uh, I think the, the metal, metastable period where Bitcoin is continuing to grow, um, but governments can still issue currency, uh, that could last for a very long time, it could even be permanent potentially. Yeah, you know, there's definitely a world in which Bitcoin just exists as the reserve peg for all fiat currencies. Definitely see that happening. You trying to hop in, Tina? Yeah, I don't agree with what people are saying, but um, yeah. I, I expect most of this decade we'll be using Bitcoin really to hodl, sell a little bit, mostly buy with fiat. It's going to become a function of the technological changes that are available in the Bitcoin ecosystem that move us to actually using Bitcoin. At some size of Bitcoin, the internal economy becomes big enough for Bitcoiners to be able to operate almost entirely within that internal economy. Until that time, I think fiat, the nature of collection of taxes, will still be income tax driven. People will begin to recognize this. They're going to change the tax code to one going from income to one going to consumption. By the way, changing to consumption tax really, pardon my expression, fucks the boomers pretty hard because most of them are in retirement, don't really have the income, and they're going to get double taxed because they're going to have paid taxes on income when they were younger. They'll pay taxes on consumption when they're older. Actually benefits millennials in a great way because that's just switching their taxes. And if you're earning money, you're indifferent to whether or not you pay an income tax or a consumption tax. So that's a way for millennials to get even. And they'll change the tax code to a consumption tax. It'll be easier for uh, some time for uh, those in that system to collect the consumption tax from the sales like a flat sales tax or something there they're like that and um, over time i think it gets harder and harder to even collect that but that can go on for quite a while i i, I see how these things can transition with a lot of the, without a lot of the strum and drang that people worry about whatever you say boomy okay boomy I don't know how it's not naturally positioned such that a federal government would have an advantage as far as investing capital, investing time, investing resources into the production and mining of it. Um, The Russians could do it. The Americans could do it. The Chinese could do it. Anybody who's got an NSA level um, group of mathematicians that sit around figuring out how to break codes all day, you know, they can design chip or they have buddies who can do that. Right. So, uh, I could see the TVA system being populated with miners to back the U S dollar. It's, it's a potential outcome. I don't know how likely it is. Yeah. That's actually, uh, something I was going to try and steer us towards, but, um, yeah, me, me and Fudd have talked about that, uh, a decent bit. Um, I think pretty much all the superpowers of the world um, 
have the chance to use Bitcoin as the escape hatch and survive in a Bitcoin world um, where they otherwise wouldn't if they get a head start. Um, they're the big geographic territories. They're the big energy producers. Um, like FUD just said, um, you know, they, they can definitely make the chips if they want to put the time and resources into it. Um, and if you can get a big mining operation that's sustainable up and running, well, um, you have something valuable to actually back bonds with now. Um, and other people won't. Yeah, and when they give out bonds in uh, Bitcoin, people can deposit, let's say, one Bitcoin that is very valuable and they won't pay interest in, in Bitcoin, but they uh, give the people like uh, in medical insurance or maybe some tax uh, deduction in another way. So this can be a different way of uh, interest in bonds. You know, to be frank, I actually hope the transition takes longer. Because the longer it takes, the more I'm absolutely able to dominate people who don't use Bitcoin as their unit of account. <laughs> I just want to see it take longer because um, I would like to see this just be gradual and smooth. Um, I would rather not have things happen like the superpowers of the world freak out and get into the equivalent of the space race for Bitcoin mining and survive um i would i rather that didn't happen because um all of those big superpower governments are fucking tyrannical getting into bitcoin isn't a card that they have to play with any urgency you know they have the printing press they can uh, accumulate a reserve position anytime they need Specifically, the Fed has the longest time to play the I'm in Bitcoin card. Uh, it seems very likely that it would be not them to defect first. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think the Fed can uh, defect because of optics. How are you supposed to go to all the other G20 countries and tell them <laughs> that's what you're doing? When they find out, they're not going to be. You know, it's, it's rogue states you see doing it so far. You know, your North Korea's. Um, is there another example of a, a nation state? With, I know Russia has um, been signaling interest in Bitcoin on a semi-official level. Well, Isn't North it? Korea is not official. It's just oh, okay, reported, Ron, right? Game. Well, Venezuela was doing some mining, right? And then Bulgaria, I think, was holding a sizable chunk of Bitcoin. Is that right? I, th I think Iran uh, mines too. Right. No, 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 no. It's legal to mine there, but the government doesn't mine. That's not correct, is it? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, if you have sanctioned cheap energy, if you're not already mining, you'll, you'll probably be mining soon. On and point. think about China basically is mining because they can go to anybody who's a large hodler in China and just got to give it. I mean, if you're collecting tax dollars from a bunch of big miners in your country, it's, it's a similar concept anyway. Same end result. I also think we're going to see, you know, sort of a hodler tax today at some point when the American uh, government wants to take a position. It'll be, the Come easiest and take way. It. It'll be the easiest way to get people to divest, especially people that are older that have a lot of capital. Guys like Paul Tudor Jones. Come and take it, bitch. But it's like, you know, this is there, there's like I pretty much like I, I'm just going to just say it bluntly. Like, I think the idea that Bitcoin is going to create a world without governments is like the most crack pipe delusional meme that is circulating in this space. Like yeah, that purely, is just purely it's retarded. Yeah, it's divorced completely from reality. It's a nice idea. It's a nice dream. If it helps helps get you in the door it's not going to go down that way yeah i mean like people are a social we're a social animal like i don't care what you say we will come together and we will form a community to deal with externalities that's what we do so the question related to government isn't so much in my mind like how is it going to kill it it's not it's how is it going to realign the incentives? It's, it's going to, it gives us a tool 
for defense so that we can hold government accountable, right? Like people are making fun of the uh, the guys carrying AK forty sevens and ARs on you know the Michigan uh, courthouse steps or whatever. Hillary Clinton was calling them domestic terrorists and shit. And you know that's a show of violence, right? It's like we the citizens have the right to be violent against the state, but we've seen over time like. <laughs> there, there's no way you're going to be able to take on the state. And so it's kind of cute. It's kind of like, you know, it's ineffective, right? So like, at least with Bitcoin, you do, you seriously do have a fucking fortress for your money and there's nothing that they can do to, to fuck with. I mean, there's little they can do. To fuck. There's some things they can do, obviously. Well, honestly, I don't agree that there's nothing that a populist can do against the government it's just the issue is enough people have to do it at the same time there's and no so will it's, it's coordination everyone's a, everyone's a fucking pussy dude we grew up in pussified times and we're all soft we're soft as fuck i'm super soft everyone's soft there's no there's no will to attack the government there's no will to take back freedoms everybody's just rolling over to this coronavirus thing and they will continue to roll over the more draconian measures that are, uh, you know, until one day it's too much. And then that's when things change. So Bitcoin's the perfect money for pussies because all you it have is. to do is divest from the fucking euro dollar, dollar, whatever financial system. And boom, you're doing it. You don't even have to pick up an AR. Exactly. You don't have to get into a Mexican standoff with the government. You can just quietly leave from the party when nobody even knows that you've left. Have you guys ever seen the Alamo? The wall around the Alamo is about four feet tall. You could jump over the wall around the Alamo. Well, people were much shorter back then. <laughs> well, I don't want to get racist around here. But anyway, it's, it's very easy to do your, your proud patriotic duty and buy some fucking Bitcoin and put it in your own wallet and just be done with it and say, guess what? That is some capital that nobody else gets to fuck with anymore. It's like I just watched uh, Waco on Netflix the other day, right? That's what's going to happen to you if you try and take the government. You get into a Mexican stand office government, they're going to tear gas you, and then, you know, fire's going to catch. They're going to burn you down and kill everybody in the building. And here's That's the reality, American Hoddle. Um, if the public sentiment shifts the wrong way, that's what's going to happen whether you have Bitcoin or not. Like, if that's the direction that um, things go, Bitcoin isn't an answer to that. It's just another way you can prepare for it. Yeah, I agree. There are degrees of self-sovereignty with this. You know, Bitcoin on an exchange, might as well just have a Schwab account. Um, you know, hold your key. Uh, government probably knows that, you know, unless you took methods to, um, you know, uh, break the common ownership heuristic, government knows that you have Bitcoin. Um, if you hold your own keys and you have anonymized yourself, but you don't know how to use Bitcoin anonymously, then you don't have the offensive side of the technology. So I see a very slow accumulation of power that's you know, a nested in nested subsets of the overall estimated Bitcoin holder population. And I, I try and get a sense of how many people are really prepared to use Bit Bitcoin in full cypherpunk mode versus people who are just, you know, holding title to it with a counterparty. Yeah, I think I think the idea of evading the state is basically impossible. I don't think you can evade the state. No matter how good your privacy is, no matter how good your OPSEC is, it's just, it's impossible. Marty would call this a cuck mentality. Yep. Yeah, it has to be possible. American Hoddle, stop being a cuck. The government has not been aware of my physical address, like where I actually am, for probably 10 years. Yeah, but Look, you're, a, you're an externality. Like, you're an outlier. I, I, think, I think you can believe two things at the same time. I think you can believe that um, we can make mass movements by governments less effective if people start using Bitcoin more privately and start learning how to use it. And at the same time that we're wholly unprepared for it. Like if the US government or one of these major governments wanted to come in, most people are KYC'd or they're linked through some other source, whether they bought shirts or bought something that's linked to them. 
They're leaking data all over the place. Ledger and Treasure servers are what most people are using. So they just simply, they, they make everyone disclose how much Bitcoin they have. They catch a few people lying about the disclosure and they throw the book at them, just like we saw with the BitTorrent enforcement attempts. And then they scare like 90% of people into complying. And then all of a sudden we have a buy for, buy for your credit market where, you know, one side is like completely doxxed and the other side can't really interact with them. Yeah, I think that's that's very close to my model. The government is yeah. going to not attack Bitcoin in the ways that it knows it can't. It's going to attack uh, any kind of sovereign or crypto anarchic use of Bitcoin and try and keep Bitcoin marginalized on as permanent a basis as possible in an approved KYC zone. And it's going to continue to force the unit of account um, of the dollar on users for compliance and taxation requirements. And I think it might lead to a very awkward situation if Bitcoin long run really does marginalize fiat, including for medium of exchange. It's going to be this just yet another weird, old fashioned vestigial uh, you know, government stricture this dollar unit of account thing. Okay, so I, I, I heard all that. And again, I have a slightly different opinion. You guys probably won't like it, but I don't care. I'm an old <laughs> boomer and I don't give a shit. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. As Bitcoin gets bigger and bigger, its internal market grows. At $20 trillion Bitcoin, at $50 trillion Bitcoin, that internal market grows larger and larger. And you're going to have some people who are going to have the attitude that we want to do business with people who have Bitcoin. And enforcement becomes more and more difficult in that world. And so, yeah, you may have this bifurcation, but who gives really a crap that you have the bifurcation? At $50 trillion Bitcoin, you have enough people who will act as intermediaries for you because they want to earn that money and you'll be able to get the goods and services you need. And at the end of the day, like Mayor de Blasio said, there's nothing we can do about it if they don't want to follow what the government says. Okay, so, so that's how the world works. Why doesn't enforcement scale? Here's two things to consider um, as far as the potential of coin bifurcation like this. One um, we're going to have second layers like Lightning now, um, which completely disconnect um, that actual connection to a specific UTXO regarding a payment. And then two, um, that data that anybody can collect to dox people decays over time. The minute that those coins start moving and changing hands and being mingled on chain like that, that data set of who has what gets less and less and less and less accurate. And if everybody is retarded enough after a compromise like that to just keep using those things, then we're all fucked. I'm going to build my mountain man cabin. Goodbye, guys. Yeah, this is this is about institutions, not about coin whitelisting or blacklisting specifically. This is just any Bitcoin that touches a regulated institution is going to be subject to these rules. Uh, so, Tina, what I'm confused about with your model is I'm thinking of IRS audits. If you make it onerous enough, if you just scale the penalties up, then you don't need to have a you know 100% or even a high hit rate on your enforcement efforts. Okay, the so, so maybe, maybe maybe you're too young because you're just a millennial and not a boomer like me. Maybe you're too young to understand that we had for a long, long time people doing business in cash and not reporting it. So you see, that's how the world really works. So there are going to be people who are going to want to do business, and they're going to find a way to do business because they just want to do business that way. People do things because... They like to make money, and some of them are willing to take a chance. Some people sell drugs under the pet threat and penalty of going to jail, but they do it anyway. That's how people are. People do things because they want to make money, and they take certain chances and risks based on the willingness to uh, take those chances to make the money that they'd like to make. So not everybody is, to use the millennial term, a cuck. Some people actually... Uh, are more than willing to take the chances that they want and need to take to make the money that they'd like to make. And that's just 
the world we live in. That's human nature. So, you know, hey. That's, that's uh, fair. They got skews very heavily small businesses and away from Fortune 500s. So if we get a small business revival, that would be awesome. But that's on the decline these days. And that's bad. Why did it help small businesses? And by the way, you can have small businesses that are intermediaries that interface with those bigger businesses. There's this whole great, great big gray market that exists out there because it turns out that economies don't work the way they do in the textbooks and sometimes companies have to get rid of inventory and so people pick up that inventory. Business doesn't actually work the way they teach in business school. Did you know that? Teach us. You guys all know what I'm talking about. The point is the world is a messy place. And people do lots of things. And I just have more. I love how Bitcoin caters to human nature. And I'm just a huge believer in human nature. And I think human nature always outs. And that makes me really optimistic on this shit. And not nearly so scared about it as other people are. On a long enough time frame, I think we all have the same destination plotted on our maps. We have very different routes mapped out for how to get there. To be clear, well, I don't think that this is a threat to Bitcoin as much as it is, is a threat to individual Bitcoiners living mm -hmm. in whatever countries that this gets implemented in. And just as a counter there, Tina, like obviously there's a, still a major cash economy, um, but we see cash restrictions increasing around the world. We see cash usage going down, not only because of those restrictions, but also because of, of consumer preference. Um, and if you if you look at... The, the easiest, the, the most effective way of countering the illicit weed trade was them, imp, them, them offering you a legal option that was more expensive and taxed. So in this case, it wouldn't just be, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I think we passed the point where we see major Western countries straight out ban Bitcoin, but they'll give people a legal pathway um, that plays by their rules. And I think that will be very, you know, appealing to a lot of people. So Matt, you know, the nice thing about Bitcoin is I can transact with it. And as those technologies develop, I don't have the problems that I have with cash. So I can be a business and I can transact without Bitcoin. And, and some of those obstacles that you're talking about that exist for cash don't exist for Bitcoin. So this naturally writes, routes around most of those problems. And if I'm operating in an internal system, you know, you're going to have some people who are going to, they'll put up some, some sales in, 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 in the real economy that's accepted by the government. But what I'm saying is there are so many smart and creative people that know how to, how to deal with some of these issues. I just think you're going to find them arise. And, and as Bitcoin gets bigger and bigger, as it's $10 trillion, $20 trillion, $50 trillion, there are a lot of people who are really going to want that Bitcoin. And one of the ways they're going to get it is earning it. So they're going to be willing to do things to earn it. And, and that's just how people are. I'm just really optimistic on, again, going back to that human nature part of things. And I, I know they tried to do away with cash. And maybe they can. But cash has that problem because you wind up with a lot of it collecting one place. You could have theoretically a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And you know, it's, it's very easy to, to deal with from a size perspective, unlike a billion dollars worth of hundreds. Just to be clear here, Bitcoin does have some advantages, but when it comes to privacy, it's infinitely easier to use cash privately than Bitcoin. You know, every Bitcoin transaction is on a immutable ledger that's going to be there forever. Uh, and ev everyone knows, I think everyone in this chat knows how difficult it is to use technology in a private way, especially if you're under a targeted attack. So, okay, in, in that $20 trillion and $50 trillion world, you don't think there'll be other scaling layers that can obscure that those identity issues that you're talking about you don't you don't think that those will exist by then i'm not talking about just doing it on the base protocol i'm talking about using lightning or what what other scaling layers get developed along the way people are creative and i'm not talking about today and projecting where we are today i'm talking about where i think we're going to be five and ten years from now I guess yeah, I mean I I oh. get the like what Matt you're saying and you're you're definitely on point like that is a serious concern 
And I'm worried too, because like, it's, yeah, I'm not worried about Bitcoin, but how many people are going to get their lives ruined or maybe even killed depending on where they are because of shit like that. But you know, Tina is right. I mean, give it five years. Like, dude, I'll, I'll do the second that cash app lets me send Satoshis the way I can dollars with that. I'm there in a heartbeat. And the second that they integrate lightning, I can just drop a single Satoshi at a time in there and give them no clue where my UTXOs are or how much Bitcoin I have. And I can use that, that Walt Garden PayPal, but not wreck all the coins I own like that. I think the biggest thing Bitcoin has going for it uh, in terms of you know, government capture, or government co-option is basically it's going to make a lot of people who are wealthy elites even wealthier, right? Like that's the number go up thing is the thing that protects Bitcoin because Bitcoin runs on human greed and it will capture the world's human greed only a matter of time. Yeah, but it's, it's the question of like the ride there and like what do the individuals do? Like that's generally the lens I look at this through because like Bitcoin is either going to succeed or it won't. I think it will. But like I have to personally ride through that wave. This is where I always, uh, I, I always hear what Matt is saying, you know, but I can't ever wrap my head around it because I have such an American point of view that it is hard for me to think about what it would be like to live in uh, you know a dictatorship i can still use a fiat and i can just sell a little bit of bitcoin and ride through some of these things i don't necessarily have to take an aggressive position i sell my bitcoin i pay my taxes years click by it's 2023 2025 2028 Different people can be doing different things as technology is developing. I anticipate mostly using fiat for a good part of this decade and selling some Bitcoin and hodling. As the tech develops, it gets better, it gets easier, scaling layers get larger. At the same time, we've got companies like Fidelity and Chase and lots of other institutions who are going to be in it. I hope, and I get a lot of pushback on this, that Bitcoiners will form political action committees and use that money to lobby politicians to look for favorable treatment in tax basis and other ways for Bitcoin as they grow richer, as the Bitcoin goes to 100,000, 200,000 million dollar Bitcoin and they look to lobby because that is what people with money do. And a lot of Bitcoiners will have a lot of money. Boomers who come into it will buy Bitcoin and if they make a lot of money in that Bitcoin, they'll want to protect that Bitcoin too. There'll be a lot of people who are going to want to protect their Bitcoin versus an adverse government. So I, I think that I see Bitcoin as a giant Godzilla that you know will start to grow from a small position to a larger position. And along the way, it gains more and more influence. And the people, the, the businesses going into this are not going to be excited about the government coming in and wrecking their game. So I... I <laughs> I I just know that human greed is really a wonderful thing for uh, helping to, to, to change things. And, and Bitcoin really caters to that. And, and number go up is a huge part of that. And so that the price going up is really going to cause a lot of people to want to protect their investment. Look, if you're XYZ company and you're making a lot of money in it, you're going to do what you can vis-a-vis -vis the politicians who you quote unquote do business with to get your way and to protect your investment. That's just how people are. And I see that as a positive. Yeah, but that's okay. That is an interesting argument. I'm going to dive us down because I agree that's going to happen. Um, that's just natural incentives at work. But the thing is, how does that play out in the reality of politics in America today? Which party gets lobbied? How does Both. that incorporate Simul into the partisan narrative? Like you, you, you gotta you lobby don't... both simultaneously, and you don't, and it doesn't. It can be a bipartisan issue because money is for everybody. I hear what you're saying that the left is going to hate it because it uses so much energy, et cetera, et cetera, and because they hate capitalism in general. But like. 
you know, the people that are elite liberals, they want money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're going to be just fine with getting lobbied uh, in Bitcoin and on Bitcoin's behalf. And is, I think is their base. Is, the, is their base going to be OK? Mm hmm. You know, they're going to go full MMT socialism at some point, right? Like, don't we all see that coming, coming, you know? So, yep. You want to keep I, I, your MOE, you know, there may be universal there may be basic time, income. Yeah, there may be a time period here where we have like a liberal version of money, which is like, you know, the, the ashes of the fiat world. And then there's like this sort of new Galt's Gulch, Ayn Randian libertarian world where the Republicans and, you know, the smart people hang out. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see that as Bitcoin, um, you know, getting protected because of lobbying. I see Bitcoin as being one of the things that gets uh, smashed into the crack in the sidewalk to completely crack it in half. Yeah, I, I mean, this is going to depend on your perspective, right? Are, are you coming at this as a number go up, bro? Or are you coming at this as a privacy, bro? Like both are very important to Bitcoin's ultimate success and both have different um you know methodologies for how to achieve that success and we need both i think the deeper is are you a money bro or are you a paper bro i think it's um are you a revolutionary who actually gives a shit about individual liberty or are you just a guy who wants to make money and um yeah i don't think the guy who wants to make money is going to be selling um a nice narrative that a lot of americans at large are gonna buy yeah but the revolutionaries are gonna lose so maybe you're just a guy who wants to win why are the revolutionaries gonna lose i mean I, I we're think... not gonna ha we're not gonna have this beautiful utopian bitcoinized world where we end the government it's not gonna ever happen no way. i'm not I'm yeah, not but saying, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not I'm saying, saying that. Why? 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 Do, why? Why don't I? Why can't I also care about care about my freedom? I mean, I do care about my freedom. To me, that's really important. I mean, I see Bitcoin as a savior for what I see as creeping totalitarianism that scares the hell out of me. And yeah. I think I think that number goes up helps to buy my way to buying off the corrupt people along the way who are so corrupted by this thing going up, so that I can save my, my my freedom that i believe in i mean uh, maybe i'm Listen, crazy. The re the revolutionary I, I may be naive always revolutionaries always lose because they always become the new power structure exactly and, they didn't lose that's winning right well, like that's the thing how yeah. like a revolution is never everybody gets woke that's not what happens some right. some people not in power who may or may not be better than the people in power now uh whip up the sheep and sell them a story and then they win that's how that then works we, that's how, that's just how agree. that works then we agree because it's a power grab going on yeah so what's the narrative because um i don't think that just make money number go up um is a narrative that a lot of people are really going to buy given the world today so let me ask you this shinobi what brought you in was it be the most private person in the world or was it make some fucking money oh it was make money but you better yeah. believe that that is exactly why i was not able to convince more than one person i know to buy anything in the time period i did that and why almost everybody i know still just laughs and goes ha bitcoin that's that's a whole different um thing because it's hard to get people to actually care about themselves i mean even in the fiat world, most people don't save money. And you can go into all the reasons for that. And we think, I think a lot of us think that partially that's based on the money itself and it disincentivizes people from holding cash balances. But it's just hard to get people to care about themselves and, no. you know, care, care about their future self. Like, if you don't care about yourself now, how the fuck are you going to care about yourself and, you know, make investments in their, in their best interest? No. Betting against the current system is a very risky endeavor. I don't think so. 
I, I don't think so either. And and I, it's fundamentally risky to bet against the prevailing narrative system yeah. anything of your time. It's very risky. So I understand why you guys say no. And that's because you buy into the principles of what you're getting into, where you're stepping into. But most people don't understand where they're stepping into yet. That's not no, why I that's not that's yeah, not why I say yeah. that. Wait, 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 that's not why I say that though. I don't say that that uh, it, it, I look at the existing system as being incredibly risky. Now, that doesn't mean that other people agree with me, but my opinion is that the existing system is staggeringly risky, and Bitcoin looks shockingly not risky to me when I compare yeah, it to that. I mean, let's talk about, like, if, if you mean perceived risk, then yes, I agree with you. If you mean real risk, no, I don't agree with you. Because, you know, the fiat system is in decay is in decline and the bitcoin system is new and thriving and on an evolutionary pathway to success so when i look at the two and my options in the current moment you know and also just pragmatically i've made a lot more money in bitcoin than i have in the you know regular system and the more you know we go up in terms of number go up the less risky it is that's not just how people think about an investment especially a first investment or near first investment because people don't invest they don't think in terms of risk reward analysis or time horizons or it's just i have money on the line now and i could lose it that's yeah, the mindset to, of somebody who first steps into i'm investing for my future what, what you need to tell your friends is that risk is a sizing issue so you know they're not going to give a shit if they lose a couple hundred bucks so tell them to put in a couple hundred bucks simple a lot most of people, people care most about retail a couple investors, hundred bucks so-called are are really just savers who have been driven out of the money and are trying to save in these growth assets and they're contaminating the you know investment price signaling system with their passive etf savings demand I people are just not ready to think about a lot of I, people do not are not interested in thinking about money which is fascinating since everyone wants money. I have bad news for you, whether you like it or not. The people who are going to come into this space, who are going to take this up 10x and maybe 50x, are going to be people who are comfortable and familiar with trading and investing. And they're going to be Wall Street types. And they're going to be wealthy people. It is not going to be your average. As much as I would love, my big ask is that the average person has 10 50 $100 in this thing. They won't. They will not come in. Most of those people will not come in, will not buy Bitcoin until Bitcoin is up 30, 40, 50, 100 X from here. That's when most people will come in. They will not come in. The people who are going to come in next are going to be Paul Tudor Jones types and the mini versions of them. They may only have $5 million, but they trade like lunatics. That's who's coming in and going to drive the price up in the next 10, 30, 50 X. Maybe can't go that great. I don't think you can quantify that. Think about price. their use case. Uh, your use case for in, Bitcoin in is digital gold, you know, not crypto anarchy. Uh, to bootstrap the you know robust tax evasion black market economy that you're talking about, that's going to be you know much smaller scale individuals and small business owners. Hold on a second. Let, let, let's 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 anchor this back to lobbying and th this is kind of like just think about what you just said tina and then take the temperature of the country right now and think about why i think that lobbying in and of itself is going to be something naturally pushed to one side and it's not going to be good enough by itself you know there there are a lot of very wealthy people who are left of center and a lot of very wealthy people who are right of center and a shocking number of people are very rich and they control the Democratic Party. So I don't agree with that. People like to protect their investments and those investments will get protected. And I and think that. If you think about the amount of the Democratic know, Party Bitcoin. is in an open revolt against that, um, that business Democrat kind of donor class. Are right, no, uh, you going to say? Oh, my God. Uh, have you watched Hoddle? Facebook, et cetera? I mean, I come on. Right. They're America trying to adopt Silicon no, no, Valley okay. as their base. I was just going to say, yeah, Sil Silicon Valley is, you know, lead is the thought, are the thought leadership in the room for the Democratic Party. 
And there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley that hold a lot of Bitcoin. That's just how it is. There's a lot of, there's a high level of Bitcoin concentrated in the Valley. And those people will lobby also from the other side. Yeah, but do the the representative bases of that party buy that narrative? Because if they don't, then all the people you are bribing, which is effectively what lobbying really is, um, are just going to get voted out. Yeah, but the easiest thing in the world, Shinobi, is, you know, give the poorest what they want. <laughs> give them fucking UBI and let them inherit the ash pile while you move to the new system. I just think that uh, it becomes very difficult to lobby against core existential government aspects like its monopoly on violence or like its monopoly on the printing press. Those are categorically um, more insulated than most political functions of government. So that's another thing to be careful of from the lobbying angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but kind of the ultimate case of a person not being able to be influenced by something his paycheck depends on him not understanding. The lobbying is not going to be in this manner where it's you now insert coin, you know, into the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. That's not going to be how the lobbying is done. The lobbying is going to be give us all the protections that we want, uh, and you know, then accelerate what you're doing because what you're doing is going to lead to eventual ruin. Build the, build the lifeboat, basically. What happens when all the people, um, you know, wash up on the beach who couldn't fit in the lifeboat and then see the, the nice uh, tropical beach house that you built there? This is, this is a true concern, for sure. For sure, for sure. Walls around the citadels. We'll have to remember to make them more than four feet high. I think the best thing to do is like uh, take the John Dillinger approach. You know, John Dillinger was like a hardcore bootlegger gangster, but he took care of all the little people that were around him and they protected him. So take care of your geographic area of little, little people if you do become a robber baron. And what I mean by that is that you're probably going to live around all midgets. Mrs. Helmsley, please don't use that term. <laughs> But it's like I, you know, I, I don't like. Wait, I, I don't like calling people who who have less little people. I find that disgusting. Please don't say that. Please. I was don't. calling them midget Tina. They suffer from dwarfism. But, how how dare you? But Tina, they okay. look so oh, okay, small <laughs> from up on my giant pile of Bitcoin. Please, please, I hate that. I I, I really hate that. <laughs> my big ask is that everyone in this chat's a little person. You included, Tina. We're not. We're not the rulers of the world. We're not the masters of the. Universe. Absolutely not. No, no. But I. I just. I. It, it, they skewered her for that years ago, and they should have because she's an ass. But um, in all seriousness, I. I would love people of average means to buy some Bitcoin now. It's nearly impossible to convince them of that. It's hard to convince people who are used to trading in stocks that they should have a what the fuck position of one percent. Uh, people are slow to come around to this, but number go up does convince an awful lot of people. And I think a lot happens as the size grows bigger and people are angry. You know, you'd be amazed. There are a lot of people who are some of whom may be, you know, not super rich, but they have their own businesses. They're, they, they don't, they're not jealous of other people. They make a nice living. It, it doesn't mean that they're that they have a ton of money, they have small businesses, they do well, they put food on the table for their family, and they would like to own some Bitcoin at some point when they see it go up. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of people in this world, and I'm really optimistic on people wanting better things for themselves, wanting a better life, wanting a freer society. This may not be true of everybody, but it's true of so many people. If we can get 30% of people in society that, that see this way, it, it convinces just an awful lot of people. Um, I'm actually really optimistic that some great things will happen. I think most of the anger that you see on both the left and the right are a lot of people who want much of the same thing, uh, but don't necessarily, they're confused by the narrative. And um, so, so they're, they're, they're sort of led around by their nose that they're confused by the narrative and, and maybe 
maybe they'll come to understand that, that they want some of the very same things. And um, the, that they won't let the red and the whole bl the red and blue thing confuse the hell out of them. I, I don't know. You, I, I you don't know, know they, that. That's, that takes more you know, optimism. You know what they want, Tina? They want that their sect or their tribe or their religion or their race to be closer to the Fed window. That's what politics is. They're all just lobbying to be closer to the money ticket. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, number go up, like with the large, um, individually wealthy, it doesn't, it changes um, mainstream retail investors' portfolio allocations over time, but it doesn't change their politics or their use case for Bitcoin. Um, there are other catalysts like currency failure that can really accelerate that. Yeah, but I see it like this. You have like uh, every wave, new people, just regular people come into Bitcoin and uh, first they come for the number go up and let's make some money. But then they are going down that rabbit hole and researching what, what do I own? And then they will find out uh, why so many fiat gets printed. And, and what do, does these uh, politicians really say? And maybe you get a shift at some point when enough people come in to think uh, like, uh, well, is this like policy or should we vote it for something else? Yeah, so that's the one way, you know, Paul and Ratchet that Bitcoin was kind of designed to do. So how do you like navigate that? Get yourself some Bitcoin. <laughs> like it, it requires a lot of patience and um, low time preference because, you know, there are a lot of quiet moves in this chess game. But like, how do you navigate this when your logic is lobby the government to smooth the seas when the thing that triggers the growth is the government? kind of disintegrating and being viewed as irrelevant and illegitimate you think that really triggers the growth it's just there it's a battle of monetary policy is what triggers the number go up growth but my point is is like you know this is a shift that can be very dangerous for individual bitcoiners not so much for bitcoin itself and Bitcoin's growth is something that is going to destabilize these larger governments. So, like, how do you navigate that sea by trying to grab on to the government? I, I don't think it destabilizes government for quite a while. I, I think that I think you're being um, too preemptive on that. And I think that Ralph Paul said the other day, people who are worried about Bitcoin being banned by governments is like that the, that's a high quality problem that that's imagining a bitcoin at 20 or 30 trillion dollars and i think that yeah you're probably right at 20 or 30 trillion dollars the government starts to get nervous but at a million to a million and a half dollar bitcoin 20 to 30 trillion dollars now that carries a lot of hefty economic weight and a lot of influence so it changes the dynamic and i keep trying to stress to people you, you can't imagine what the world is going to look like um, at those sizes and, and those wealth values of Bitcoin, when you're sitting in a world of under $200 billion, it's just so very different. Size just matters so much. And I think that the world just looks very different the way it's treated. It, it's so dangerous to project where we are today and assume that's what the world will look like when you get to the to that time. I don't really think it will. I think it'll look very different. Well, look let at me, this. Let me. Like, oh, go ahead. Or like my, I'm gonna like center this on America. Um, just look at the weed market. Um, look at how financially independent from the federal government, um, states who legalize weed and tax that have been able to get. Just think about the fact that every state who does that is pretty much telling the federal government. Um, fuck you and your laws, we're going to generate our own revenue and not just suckle your tit. And think about the bigger Bitcoin gets. Um, 
what a massive potential um, revenue stream not dependent on the federal government that is. Think about how much more powerful of a tool you are giving states in this country to go suck my dick, federal government, fuck your laws. I'm going to generate my own revenue. And that's let, let, and the, wait wait and that's bad for Bitcoin how? It's it's bad for any kind of strategy that depends on the federal government stepping up and doing something. No, I don't mean that. What I'm saying though is that that that's very significant. If states become that much more powerful and regions become that much more powerful and influential, it's going to help to control the narrative. That's exactly what I'm saying. And so that that, I'm not that really starts that. to change that's change the whole nature of the conversation i'm I'm not saying that you know but listen governments are not monolithic governments are organic and they're collections of individuals and you can infect a collection of individuals like we've already seen this you know in congress how like a bunch of the congressmen and senators had bitcoin when the dude said you know bitcoin is a utopian dream world or whatever the fuck he said on the congressional floor it's like you can already see the infection starting to spread uh, through the organism. So yeah, but I'm, like, not, I'm not saying we're dependent on government. I'm just saying like it, it is a strategy that is going to play out. I'm not saying like it's the winning move. I think the winning move is every strategy at once. Okay. Because it, it's like, you know, the, the way, let's use a corona analogy. Uh, how does it help the virus spread if you infect some old sick dude who never leaves his house and then dies alone um, without ever having interacted with anybody after they got infected? Well, got a morbid it, loophole. It, well, it, you know, you, you'd have to think about it from a systems wide perspective, right? If you've infected that guy, you've also infected millions of people. And some of them are going to be influential, have power, have money. You know, also that guy's stats would go to somebody when he died. Maybe that person is more uh, <laughs> up to take on the charge against the, the forces who want to see Bitcoin put down. Well, here's like, here, here, look at like, let's look at this through like the state and then the federal government lens. I think okay. that as Bitcoin is growing, um, states in the U.S. Are going to have a massive incentive to just go with it and just like whatever. Um, how the hell can we benefit from this as is? Um, because they're dependent on something else right now. Like that's an opportunity for freedom from something. Whereas if the federal government starts to get in and, and go like we have to use this in a massive way, I think that will be very different. It will not be a, a freedom from some dependence. It will be a loss of control. And so the attitude there is not taking advantage of an opportunity. It's like, let's clamp down as much control as possible because it's slipping out of our hands. But, but so when, when Visa and MasterCard and JP Morgan Chase and other large financial institutions make this a bigger and bigger part of their business and they become scaling layers on Bitcoin and they don't have to transact on the Fed wire uh, and it changes the whole nature of their business. Doesn't that change their position vis-a-vis -vis the federal government? Imagine if JP Morgan Chase had Bitcoin and it was a scaling layer and doing all sorts of things and that was 60% of their business. Aren't they in a different position vis-a-vis -vis the Fed system at that point than they are today? They yeah, can't absolutely. say they can't say fuck you today. They, they might they be able to say own fuck the mining you then. world. No, but that's why, the point, why would they and then the say federal government then? in that world um scrambles in a mad panic to start mining as massively as possible to be part of that settlement layer that they don't run right now um and generate revenue from that and the control that they can fucking have from that because otherwise they lose all control and that's but, my point is like of the federal government in my mind i think is way way more likely to come into this space with the attitude of mine now where state governments are going to be much more inclined to go wow this is a really useful thing let's use this instead and not except, so much yeah, but, mine but now both, both things are going to happen except both they're going to come happen. in and they're only on four percent of the mining because they're going to be mining controlled by other people other other institutions and other entities and at that point you know a lot of things will have changed along the way they can say mine now and it's like who the fuck do you think you are 
Tina, you know, the U.S. government can just turn on the money printer and print as many mining chips as they have electricity to that's, fucking run. And that's in 2020. And, and, that, and in 2025, 2030, 2035, maybe nobody actually wants those things. What I'm saying is be careful projecting the existing world into that future world for the assumptions that you're making. You need to un look at your underlying assumptions that you're making. And what I'm saying is I don't think your underlying assumptions are accurate. I think they're highly flawed. And so you, you cannot project the world that we live in today and assume that that's what the world looks like at market cap. $50 trillion, $20 trillion, $100 trillion. It's going to look different. The government is an employer with a lot of special legal privileges, um, and all the people who work for that employer want to keep their job. And when the fucking revenue that allows them to stay employed starts disappearing, they're going to go into a mad panic to do whatever the fuck they can to guarantee that they still have money to get paid. And the federal government is much more inclined to go ours and I'll try worry. to insert control over that because they actually have the scale and resources if they act early enough to maybe actually do that. I'll worry about that then. And my bet is they won't act early enough because they almost never do. So I'm, I'm really not as concerned about that as you are. And you always have to remember – my father used to like to say, never underestimate the next guy. And just like I wouldn't underestimate the federal government, the federal government ought not to underestimate the world in that future world you're talking about. Um, it may be a tough battle, but you're not going to be talking about entities that have no, no influence and power and ability to pull strings and do things. Um, I'm very reluctant to look forward 10 and 15 years into the future. And I think that the next two, three, four years, five years, this is not anywhere close to a real problem. And I think that when it gets to be a problem, I think the world looks very different. The fun thing is that Raul quantified it. He said, listen, Bitcoin, I know you're big boys. I know you've been invested, but guess what? Governments still don't take you seriously because you're a very small pond and said, okay, another hundred X, whatever it is exactly, and they will take you seriously. And he has a good point. Um, but we continue to see good signs like CME offering Bitcoin futures, uh, GBTC in general, Bitcoin interest accounts, whatever it is of adoption and integration into other parts of the financial network. Now, as soon as we see Fidelity Bitcoin, something like that, I would argue Bitcoin's adoption is not a price function as much as an access function because it's been very hard to get Bitcoin, no matter when you want to get Bitcoin, you always have to go somewhere else, more or less, and get Bitcoin. Now it's as easy as installing an app on your phone and you can have pseudo Bitcoin that could be real physical Bitcoin of your own if you wanted and if you understand the difference. But it's still not sitting there ready access in a 401k account or in a retirement account of every single American that wanted to have one of those. When we get to that point, then you see those premiums on GBDC drop towards zero because you can just buy it some other way. And, you know, I don't know, different world. Matt, you've been really quiet for a while. Start a fight with Tina. He's been too calm. Honestly, I've been I've been zoning out a little bit here. I uh I think we've we've like hit the realm of over speculation. We're oracles, dude. That's what we gotta do. <laughs> you can't you can't over speculate, bro. That's all we ever do here. We're grinding that the lens here. I agree with Matt. That's what I tried to say. It, 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 you're, you're looking too far into the future. It, it's too hard to see. The world's going to look very different then. Yeah, but Tina, Matt said it in like three words. <laughs> I know. I was really impressed with that. If I had more time, I would have said less. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a like really strong institutional pathway to um, advancing Bitcoin politically. Like price and access, absolutely. But for banking, I mean, think about it. you provide Bitcoin exchange, banking services, you calculate people's tax obligations, send it off to the federal government. You don't care beyond that. The wealthy principals of your company, meanwhile, are going to be hoarding Bitcoin 
on a personal basis. Um, and then on the side, you know, they don't care. It's regulated by, you know, FinCEN and Treasury um, IRS. You know, we receive our tax revenue from it. It's just to the Fed. It's just, you know, an asset managed by this company. To the company, it's just another profitable leg of their business. The political power in Bitcoin, I think, will always come from people behaving in anarchic ways and not from institutions lobbying or officialdom. Just going to be greed. Everyone's going to want some. Yeah, but everyone will want title to uh, with proof of reserves or they'll want to hold Bitcoin with a private key they control. You know, it's a different story for people to be doing gray market commerce with it. And for people to be, you know, developing their capability with it to that point. And, you know, the, all the, the ecosystem of devices and software is rapidly coming down to meet in the middle, skill-wise. How are you going to stop somebody from using an open dime that's worth $5,000 buying something? How are you going to do that? It's physical. You can't send it over the internet. It's just gold. There's plenty. It's playing business. Hold on. The same way that we stop you from doing drugs, Tina, we're going to fucking kick your door in at three in the morning, shoot your fucking dog and literally rip all the walls down to make sure you're not hiding open dimes anywhere. Except the fact they don't do that now with cash. Yeah, open dime is just cash or gold. It's the same as cash. I mean, they don't do that now. Just pay your damn taxes. Don't worry about it so much. You pay your taxes. Real quick, it's that, fun to have you, American Hoddle. Enjoy baby duty. Thanks, guys. Got to gotta go rock this baby to sleep. That's exactly the, the state's strategy here, I think. It's just keep people paying their taxes, keep the, the gray market usage from developing, and then let just, just let Bitcoin be another asset. They want They want Bitcoin to be gold for... Uh, as far as its functionality set goes, they want that subset, um, which is what the majority of present day Bitcoin holders are seeking it for. And they want to marginalize everything else. That's that's like the best fit strategy, I think, for a, an uncensorable phenomenon. It would be great to have the problem that you walk in and uh, you're looking to buy that new car, the new truck, whatever. And uh you you worry about what's the premium or not on the open dime you're going to hand your car dealer. <laughs> Alrighty, so yeah, I think we're kind of hitting the point of just meandering around. So, does anybody else have like a fresh starting point or or thing related to this they want to toss out there? We could try discussing the end game where uh fiat is potentially extinguished or marginalized to the point that it becomes itself an existential matter for governments but that requires a whole lot of assumptions you know because we're talking about a distant event with a lot of uh you know preconditions in that case but whether that happens or not whether fiat has a uh, you know a persistent role into a in a Bitcoin future that might, might be useful to speculate on. Everybody burn the heretic. Maybe like fiat backed by Bitcoin reserves. Yeah, I, I'm not even thinking backed. I'm thinking something that just there remains an issuer with a monopoly sphere that allows it to um, exert seniorage and it holds it in place by offering its citizens a UBI or other. Um, it was like, like somebody said earlier, it's just doling out access to the spigot can like maintain utility a lot of token. economics. USA like, token. Just like fiat sticking around. Like, could the government survive if the only reason you bought dollars was to pay your taxes come tax time? Um, essentially, yeah. Or you would be receiving a steady dollar income that you would 
probably put some or most of into Bitcoin, but because they're able to keep the, you know, this undesirable currency ubiquitous and circulating, it still remains the MOE and the UOA. You mean like Venezuela? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's not that's not going to work. That's just fantasy. I, I'd maintain for a while, continue maintain, the road to hyper-Bitcoinization is through the destruction of the bond market. And there will be a time that as people want to exchange their assets for Bitcoin, they will sell their bonds and they will watch the bond market implode. And eventually debtors will buy out their loans at you know multi uh, pennies on the dollar, 10 cents on the dollar, 5 cents on the dollar. And that that becomes the natural fait accompli for destruction of fiat because fiat is debt-based money. There'll be a point when nobody will want to take fiat. I'm, I'm not concerned about that. It, it will just... It will just end of its own accord and, and governments can print all they want of it. But if you don't want it, you just won't accept it. Um, the population cannot be forced to take a money that it doesn't want to take. It just can't be. It can't be forced by guns. It can't be forced by anything. The population cannot be forced. If you don't want to take that money or accept that money, you just won't. You're not going to exchange value for that money. We saw this in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, um, they used to say, we pretend to work and you pretend to pay us. The only way it worked is because their officials had access to special stores, but, but the money was garbage and everybody knew the money was garbage. The population didn't accept it. They had a thriving black market. That's the only way things got done in the former Soviet Union. But this isn't theoretical anymore, right? We see governments around the world uh, printing at a speed that I mean, I think if people asked five months ago, six months ago, if, if we were going to be in this situation right now, no one really saw that coming, not at that speed. Um, so do we start seeing, you know, these these lesser these lesser economies, their fiat fail uh, first? Like, are we going to start seeing that at a rapid take over the next two years, three years? Like, what's the timeline there? That's where people are kind of at at this point. And, you know, the irony is, though the Fed can be the biggest printer, it's also the last man standing in this system simply because of economy size and pervasiveness of unit of account and other people ultimately pegging to it. Uh, so a lot of people are saying that the Aussie dollar has been depreciated a lot already. Um, China is not necessarily keeping up. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Nick Carter speculates that a lot of countries dollarize. I think he may be right about that. I don't know exactly how that works, but there's a really good chance that countries attempt to dollarize. The populations may start to do it themselves. Uh, I don't understand <coughs> exactly how some of these stable coins will work or uh, uh, central bank issued digital currencies. I'm not sure I fully get this. But there's a really good chance that those other currencies first dollarize and ultimately uh, I, I think that will make I, I think any entree into um, a, a digital a, a cryptocurrency type of digital dollar will make it easier to buy Bitcoin. And, and, and some people will will buy Bitcoin with it, but they'll prefer to use dollars for a while. You think French people would be fine with using U.S. dollars that are just getting printed at will by a foreign government? Hey, they, they use euros, which aren't worth anything. So sure, why not? <laughs> do, do you guys remember? The ECB um, is basically poker, a foreign government to them. Do, do you guys remember Poker Travis? Um, maybe you know him as Jal, um, guy who runs around yelling about John Nash and Bitcoin all the time. Yes. Don't exactly uh, know what he's on about, though. Yeah, uh, he like he, he actually used to hang out in here a lot, um, and we would talk about all that stuff um, very frequently. But he had this notion um, that Bitcoin could just kind of keep fiat in check and not really kill it um, by allowing governments to just peg you know their currencies to Bitcoin, and I just think. That is a completely untenable um, way of existing. And this is why I am positive if Bitcoin doesn't die, it will literally just eat all of their money. Is because think about that. If you are trying to peg your currency to Bitcoin, then Bitcoin's price 
in your currency becomes literally the only thing that matters in terms of your inflation rate. You are measuring it against Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin, and that's it. So firstly, you can no longer play any kind of economic policy management to mitigate or manage the inflation of literally anything else. It's Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. But that and then, and no then, sense. no, but then, and also think like the only way you can really maintain that peg is to print more money to buy Bitcoin when demand increases um, past the supply. Um, or I mean, no, no, wait, um, to, to buy Bitcoin when the demand is dropping um, and, and the price goes down or actually sell Bitcoin um, when the demand is rising um, to keep the price down. And eventually, um, you know, you run out of Bitcoin when the demand keeps growing and it breaks. Like that, that is literally, it is impossible if the demand for Bitcoin grows um, for that not to break. So like yeah, how just is there like a, a gold standard monetary backing schemes are just price fixing arrangements and they're, they're silly. Yeah. So like how I, I don't see any way in the real long term that fiat could exist with Bitcoin. Like, it, would, it would be a free float, uh, plus just Gresham's law. If you, and this might be, you know, post hyperinflation of the current dollar, um, there might be different fractional reserve rules um, or reserve requirements, whatever, to keep, um, you know, very high dollar velocity from just, you know, blowing up. Um, but I could see Gresham's law maintaining, you know, you're going to keep Bitcoin uh, relatively out of circulation. You're going to keep the default currency in circulation, add in the um sort of techno fascist surveillance state working to enforce tax collection on bitcoin transactions you so know i, I, can, had, see, so I can see so, several so folk, gener folk, generations of dollars so, so folk, 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 so i have this thing you really want it's really special you've been looking for this for a long time and it's a special thing i'll sell it to you for a half a million dollars uh, oh wait a minute i actually don't want your dollars you really want this thing i'll take some bitcoin for that okay how's that gonna work well See, this is kind of the thing like the matt store? brought this up like when we first or jumped this into this like that's venezuela that goes to venezuela and they're just throwing the money on the street like trash because it's worth nothing yeah hyperinflations are a good way to marginalize a fiat currency that's why I, I mentioned this this might be a post hyperinflation, you know, rebooted dollar or a currency that's not um you know subject to the level of um you know money creation through banking that the dollar is. Bitcoin Bitcoin actually changes hyperinflation. You can have a growing value of Bitcoin. So you don't actually see the hyperinflation because the hyperinflation is happening vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin. So you still have this existing economy which looks like it's operating just fine. But in the meantime, Bitcoin is growing more and more in value. So the people desperately want that thing that's going up in value. So it actually turns hyperinflation on its head some, doesn't it? Well, it sounds similar to what happened with like financial assets and um, foreign holdings of dollars over the the generations right i mean sorry over the decades yeah so people value a bit in, uh, often in fiat in dollars or yeah i guess you could uh, value it in uh, gold but that's basically uh, a you value something that is constant with something that isn't constant and and that's the other way around it, 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 because Bitcoin is the constant one, but now people don't think in that way yet. So I think what you just said is right about, so stocks have been in a kind of hyperinflation vis-a-vis -vis dollars. And so you have portions of the population <clears throat> gaining a lot of wealth versus other portions of the populations who own capital assets. So it's one thing to have a good business, but if you have really great capital assets 
those capital assets go up a lot in value relative to everything else. So the Google guys get rich and uh, Bill Gates gets rich and, and uh, uh, Zuckerberg gets rich. But other people don't. So you actually have this happening right now. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Like we have a very fascinating like lifetime ahead of us. Decade. <laughs> uh, man, I think this this process involves many stages of um, maybe graceful, maybe not so much degradation of old institutions. It's over in fourteen years, maybe less. It's going to go very, very, very fast. It'll make your head spin. You'll already be well into a new economy come 14 years from now. Everything will be different. This is going to happen incredibly fast. That's how everything has happened in the last 40 years. It'll be shockingly fast. I've seen it. I know how this shit works with money, but with everything else. And this is no different. And it's going to happen faster than what we've seen with everything else. This will be faster than the internet. This will be faster than technology and computerization. This is going to be really, really fast. All right, let's go around the room and let's see um, if you're feeling bearish or bullish. Tina. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to answer that? <laughs> Pretty much everybody knows what I think. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's like re really think about the dynamic of like fiat and Bitcoin interacting like this. It's it creates uh, the dynamic of get in the lifeboat. And if you miss it, well, you're going to get fucked. Here's how I gauge how bullish I am. If most people think I'm crazy, I know I'm much closer to being right. And right now, I think pretty much everybody thinks I'm nuts, and that makes me very happy. Uh, that, I think you're 95 plus percent right. Well, that makes me so, really that makes me that. really bearish. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, man. No, that's okay. I I didn't change my mind at all. <laughs> I know. That's not what what we're here for. Alrighty. I'm so, short term, short medium term bullish as fuck on Bitcoin as a store of value asset. And um, on a yeah, 15, 20 year time frame, I begin to get pretty bullish about Bitcoin driven political transformations. But I think some of them will take 50 years, a couple generations even to complete. I'm more bullish than I've ever been, but that always seems to be the case. <laughs> the Atlantic says it's only going to take ten trillion dollars to clean up this Great Depression, too. Woo! Yeah, let's just say that I think the number is going to go up, but I wouldn't call that bullish because I'm not really excited about what that means. Why not? Number goes up in good times and bad times, designed oh. to pump forever. There's a post I've been trying for the last week to find. I need to get less lazy with Google. But um, I remember Greg Maxwell writing something in Bitcoin Talk back in like 2012 or 2013 about how fast Bitcoin grows and what that means for political stability in the world. And let's just say that I've always hoped that things would go a little slower than they traditionally have. Do you think Bitcoin can upset the apple cart any more than the apple cart seems to already be upset? Tina, I think if we grow fast enough in 10 years, you're going to be having wars fought over Bitcoin. Like that, that's a thing like, you know, plan B talking about that. I think on, was it uh, McCormick's or Stefan's um, where he went into that, but like he, he is not crazy talking like that. All right, so that seems like a super upbeat note to end on. You guys happy with that? They didn't call it everything. It's a good discussion. Yeah, but I don't know. I, honestly, though, I think we're kind of getting to the, the meandering point. So I don't know if any everybody wants to toss in a final thought. We'll go around the room, call it quits for the day. Yeah, I just want to note that Fred's prompted that 
abrupt ending and uh, destroyed the narrative. So uh, let's get with it and uh, we'll see how it goes. Tina, give us a thought. Bitcoin makes me very optimistic for the future. I think you're going to see a lot of great things come from it. I'm not nearly as scared or nervous as other people are. I'm not anticipating huge negatives coming out of this. I think we'll route on those issues. And I remain very, very bullish on great things coming from Bitcoin and great things for humanity coming from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a technology of peace and love, not of war. <laughs> but yeah, volatility is possible. I don't think I'm familiar with Plan B's argument about uh, armed conflict over Bitcoin, but I'll check that out. Right. Caso, you got anything for us? I'm going to quit. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Keep talking Bitcoin, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt, let's, let's get the last uh, serious thought out of somebody before I take us out being a troll. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed this. Look forward to doing more of these uh, while we nail down the format. Um, you know, just I, I, I think people should ignore the noise. They shouldn't overthink it, and they should stay humble, and they should stack stats. All right, and everybody, um, you know, this is the end of the second in the Maw. Uh, don't forget to wear a mask and wash your penis. Later, everybody. Dragon's mouth. Bye.